One is um, kind of how they started viewing Apache Flink, um, and the second one is like what, what were the things they figured out are important to pay attention to when you operate it at large scale. So um, some of the use cases that, um, that these lessons learned are taken from here, here are just a few um, that, that I mentioned. There, there are more for which we've gathered that, but here are just a few from, um, from which explicitly some of these lessons learned are taken. So um, first one is um, we're working uh, for a while now with, uh, with Netflix to establish um, infrastructure for, for various use cases um, amongst that streaming, um, streaming ingestion and uh, modeling of user interaction sessions. The interesting um, takeaway for us from that is both, both in, the, in the way we've learned about what artifacts or what problems occur at scale, especially because they're running everything on, on Amazon and the per uh, peculiarities of like the Amazon container um, engines and the, uh, and the behavior of S3 and so on. And also because of the, um, the types of, of jobs they're running, which are an interesting mix of stateless jobs, jobs with small states, and jobs with very, very large state. Um, just to give you an idea of, well, okay, this looks, it looks much better originally. This is, I think, gets lost somewhere in the, in the video cable. Um, like the, the scale that this is, uh, that this is running is, um, is, is quite, quite significant. It's running, like Flink is running in, in over 3,000 uh, container images um, together with 4,000 Kafka brokers and, and hundreds of streams. Um, Another of the use cases that, that some of these lessons learned here are, um, are taken from is, is our collaboration with Alibaba. So Alibaba has a system called Blink, which is based on Flink. It's, uh, if you wish, an adoption of Flink, with, uh, with, which is like, more integrated with, their, with the way their Yarn uh, cluster is set up and so on, and the way their you know, the integration with their you know, operating metric system and, and all of that. It's, it's been, when it started out, a fairly significant difference from Flink, but now it's a very small difference from Flink. We've sort of worked very hard together with them to kind of um, merge, merge most of the, of the two systems. So they're, they're very similar these day, uh, today. Um, and yeah, the, the scale that they're running this on is probably even, even, even uh, larger. So they're, they're single Flink jobs running on more than thousands of nodes with tens of terabytes of like in-process in state. And uh, one of the really cool things that this thing, thing does is um, when, when there's this crazy shopping holiday in China called the Singles Day, which is roughly like the Chinese equivalent of the Black Friday that, uh, in the US, and the, the, the real-time like real search optimization to, to figure out which, which products should be you know, ranked up and down and so on, depending on, on trends and so on, is actually running on this, on this stream computation system, which is, which is pretty significant. Um, and, and one other use case out that we've that we've taken a, a few interesting lessons learned from, especially for the first section, like how do we do we view uh, Flink these days, um, is from um, from that use case. It's um, it's a social network called Drive Tribe. It's by the by the guys that used to do um, Top Gear, now do the Grand Tour, um, and they they um, their team has. Obviously, not the three themselves, but they're like the technic technical team has actually implemented the social network, if you wish, almost completely on top of stream processing. So everything comes, enters, uh, every user interaction comes, is locked into, in this case, Kafka. And then um, you have a stream processor that, that consumes this lock of actions and computes the view of the world as it's, a, as it's to be presented to all the users uh, on the website. And then it's mirrored out to Elasticsearch and Redis to be actually served by the, by the read layer. So this uh, this doesn't run at quite the scale as the others do, but it's kind of a, it's an interesting complexity in itself because it's almost the entire application of that social network that runs in the stream processor, not just you know like individual parts that support it. And um, like the, I, I'd like to start with the first part, like what have we learned about how users actually view Flink? That was that was kind of an interesting um, pro process for us because you know we always try to explain what what Flink is to users, and once in a while we actually try to listen. And okay, if if you explain Flink to us now, how would you actually describe it? And it was very interesting because some of them described it completely different than than we would describe it. And um, here's here's something we we learned that's actually interesting. Um, so. Um, M many of us told us, okay, we, we view Flink these days actually as a, as a system for, you know, pretty generic, stateful event-driven processing, meaning, 
you, ha you have a system that, that, that you, take as, you take as a building block for implementing stateful services, stateful microservices. It reacts to events, to calls. It has, it has application state that it maintains, and it, it triggers other actions. And it's, it's responsible for maintaining the consistency and durability and the persistence of all that, that application state. Um, incidentally, without a database. That's the, that would be the classical way to do it. So it's kind of a framework. Um, that, that, that kind of view goes more to the left side, a, fl a framework for event-driven um, applications to build them based on, on patterns like event sourcing or um, command query responsibility segregation. Um, then there's, of course, s users that say, yeah, it's, uh, it's a stream processing framework. You know, you have your streams of events and you compute over the streams of events. You do Windows, session windows, tumbling windows, and all of that. And, um, of course, a lot of users still view it as a batch processing framework. So we've, we've kind of, I've kind of organized this, like this view that we learned about it as this. Um, it's kind of different, different crowds, I would say, that the users come from that describe it in these different angles. Um, the crowd that describes it as event-driven applications is, is usually exactly um, teams that, that build applications, the, you know, the, the yeah, front-end front background of the live, of the live services of uh, teams. Versus the other, the other teams are often like the, the data teams in the companies that say, you know, for us it's a stream processor or, or a batch processor. But the kind of common substrate is that it's a, it's a system that's built actually on, on stateful event processing. And um, the, the, the most interesting description I've heard, ho heard how, how um, users view Flink is actually, it's a, it's a system for actually realizing the, the, in, the neat memory image model for, um, for applications and persistence. So what, what does that mean? Um, if, you want to, if you want to build a, uh, a distributed stateful application, um, there's, there's a very interesting pattern to do it. Um, it's based on, based on the idea of event sourcing. Every time you, do an, you want to do an interaction with that, with that application, you, you create an event that, that describes the application, you put it into a log that where it is persistent, and then you let actually the application uh, process it. And, the, and then the application becomes very, very simple. It's just, it's just a process that consumes an event and updates some arbitrary memory data structures. You know, like it, it would be a standalone process, nothing, nothing more. There's no, there's no abstraction that makes actually these data structures in hindsight go against, you know, like um, a database via an or M um, framework or, or whatever. It's really just like you would have your standalone Java application. And then periodically, Flink actually takes your snapshot of that, of that thing. That's like the, the memory image and uses that for persistence. And, and when a failure happens, what it does is it restores you the memory image and replaces you all the events that have happened since, the, since that failure. Just, just view, viewed like that. There's actually no, there's nothing that's particular to stream processing in here. It's just a mechanism to actually have processes with state that run and you make them you make them recoverable or you make them you make them fault tolerant in a very efficient way because while you're actually processing and interacting with these local data structures you worry about nothing right there's there's no additional cost that you pay for any persistence and so on there's just like once in a while a background process that does you a snapshot persistence of that memory image and and then Flink would actually be, if you wish, a distributed instantiation of that system. So you have events coming in, and you have a lot of individual processes that just consume the events and manipulate their internal state and do something. And, and Flink is the system that kind of keeps this whole thing for tolerant um, and, and consistent in case, of, in case of failures. So that was, um, there was a very interesting, interesting lesson for me. That is how, how we, we found uh, quite a few users actually describing back the system to us. Um, these old terms like event sourcing and, and, and memory image are actually terms that have been, have been coined before by, um, you know, by, by, by people that work in the, in the space of application engineering that come up with design patterns there and so on. And it just turned out this fits the whole idea of, of, of Link so well. So in the... Oh, this looks horrible. Um, th these should be these should be gloriously yellow glowing bubbles over there. Just just picture them as such. Um, so the 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 whole way that then Flink operates in a, in a distributed fashion is actually you know you have this you have these connected pieces of distributed uh, computation attached with some um, em embedded state that 
for, for all means to the application programmer actually reacts as, as local state at, at memory speed. And you just have, have events that flow through that, that manipulate the state and some once in a while Flink scans over the whole thing and, and takes it this snapshot and makes sure everything is everything is consistent. And because there's such a there's in Flink is designed to have kind of a loose coupling between those between those things, you can actually um, you can restore or you can restore um, the, the state of these computations from these snapshots, or you can actually alter the, uh, the computation or the, the whole, whole structure of how, how computation depends on each other and still restore it. Because there's like a loose coupling between um, the state and the computation, and it's every time you restore it, um, it's, kind of, it's a matching procedure that matches the state into the computation. So it's kind of a, an interesting um, application building framework in, in some sense based on yeah, based on, on, on the idea of, it has so many names, event sourcing, reactive programming, um, but, but in, in essence, together with local stateful computation and, and snapshots. So another way to view this would be actually to say, if the, if the classical way of building, building applications is, you know, you have, a, you have a layer of compute and you have a layer of a database for persistence, um, what, what Flink really, gives you is, a, is an architecture to, to change this into, you do, you do require persistent storage for streams, something like, like a log, something like Kafka or so, but then it gives you a very good building block to actually say, transform this to an architecture where application state is something that is completely, completely local and it just interacts with, uh, with, with storage in a, in a like snapshot persistence mechanism. All right, so, um, what what this will actually this may actually now create create some 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 confusion in uh, in in the mind of trying to okay piece that together okay if the, if it's that building block you know it's it's probably not not very hard to imagine how such a building block is a really nice building block for stream processing because stream processing is really exactly that you take events and you you try to put them into perspective of each other with the help of some local state and this local state you know in the simplest case it's just a counter per window right or it's a it's it's the state of a session or anything right so this this actually gives you um, gives you the interesting building blocks just from the runtime. Um, there's, an, there's an aspect in here that I haven't actually talked about much, and I don't have the time today to talk about that, but this is the, the handling of time that we built into Flink, which is kind of the second ingredient that, that then helps it to make, make it a really, a really good match for stream processing, primitives to track um, progress in event time, completeness of data, and so on. So um, because it, it seems like this is a very a fairly primitive set of, um, or a fairly basic and general set of building primitives that is very powerful for these different use cases, um, Flink's actually come, come up with a different, a, a different set of layers. So um, that's also something we, we interestingly learned from, um, fr from users, how they, if, they, if they look at Flink today, how they, how they want to approach it. And um, the, the latest set of, um, of users actually have this interesting transition, how they go from, from coarse grained to ever more fine grained um, levels of abstraction. So the, the most the most basic primitive is on the on the bottom layer. It really gives you just these events, times, and snapshots, and so on. Uh, slightly more more high level is the data streams API, which gives you the DSL for stream processing and batch processing. And then on top of this, um, primitives for or APIs for um, for streaming SQL. The table API is kind of a an embedded DSL that is that is roughly the same as, as SQL. And you can, you can kind of navigate this, um, this layers of abstraction depending on, on what you want to do. If you want to, if you want to just build um, an application that generates some insights from a, from a stream of events, you, you may start on that level. If you then want something slightly more complex that, you know, that has ver a very custom way of, doing, of deriving, um, deriving you know, statistics over, over windows of state over time, then you go a level below. And if you actually want to build really just a custom application that, that reacts to um, that reacts to events, then then you go even one level below. And the interesting thing is you can mix all these levels in the same application. And and we do actually see that as as pro as um, as projects go on and go on and go on, and they try to, and th they come to the point that they say, okay, we've actually built this. Now, can we actually even reflect that characteristic in the real in the real time program? Can we reflect that more? And can we re reflect that other characteristic? They start actually moving down that stack bit by bit by bit. So, we've actually seen a lot of folks that that actually moved from the data stream API from from how you define windows there just to the to the 
layer one below where they say, okay, just give me arbitrary state, give me some timers, um, make sure it's consistent, and I just I just wire together whatever I want. Um, don't don't dictate me any API, so just give me compute and state, and I'll do the rest. All right, so that that is kind of a how how our, our view of Flink kind of evolved over time with uh, with what we what we saw how how our users are using it. Um, there's also another part of it um, that um, where, where we learned kind of um, how it behaves in an in an operational context that are that I'd like to share um, and I'd like to sh start actually with a with a very neat uh, insight and that is that the event stream pipeline in general is a is, is something that works so if you if you just piece together the the streaming and your compute and so on this is this kind of a it's a very robust thing there's not a lot of like very complicated memory management or here here or there or parameters that you need to tune here and there involved that parts just works um, there are of course things that um, that 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 come up again and again and here there are a few like more more general insights and then there's one that I'd like to actually spend some time on uh, iterating so there, there are a few obvious things like okay dependency conflicts are probably the thing that <laughs> I have, the, I have the feeling that users spend most time on their way to production solving dependency conflicts these days, um, or rough edges around the deployment ecosystem because it's really a, it's really a crazy space. Everything behaves and evolves kind of in in different way. Yarn, Mesos, Docker, all the security um, uh, infrastructure. Um, there's this fancy idea of overlay networks in, in container engines, which is conceptually a really nice thing, but messes up everything for the systems that actually run inside them and have to do um, service discovery now all of a sudden very different. So these are these are things that are like obviously on the in the space around around Flink that um, that have to be paid attention on. Um, and another thing that we kind of realized and where we where we plan to um, to invest some work in is. That we, we we've seen that the dependency on any external system eventually causes avoidable downtime, if you wish. So the snapshots that that Flink takes at the moment have to go somewhere. In most cases, it's HDFS, S3, and NFS. And you would actually you would actually think that most companies have their HDFS cluster well under control, or S3 is something that's generally available. But apparently, that's not always the case. So the the <laughs> I don't know if you remember this a few weeks ago when S3 had this downtime and half the internet stopped working. That's also when we got this flood of email like, okay, all our Flink clusters kind of on on Amazon, you know, they, they fail to checkpoint obviously because S, S3 is down. And um, there's there's very inter there's there's a few things that w we can actually do. So we've kind of changed I think the mindset since then a little bit and 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 thought, okay. Um, let's actually try and really make it as independent as possible in the future of all of these dependencies while they, you know, exploit them while they work, but don't, don't be blocked by them for the times that they don't work. Um, type serialization sounded like something that we would almost consider as a soft problem when we were still doing, let's say, stream processing in the early days or more um, even before that batch processing. Um, but it, in, in, in streaming the whole um, the whole serialization um, can of worms has actually um, been opened again and and come back as a as a very different um, beast. First of all, um, streaming has different patterns with which it interacts with data structures, which make kind of serialization um, some of the tricks that that we added to Flink to make serialization cheap and batch not quite as efficient. But the even the even more important thing is that all of a sudden. Remember this figure from a few slides back where I said that Flink actually starts owning, starts holding the state, the compute and the state together and not the database anymore, which actually means that you, would, you, you want to start doing the same things with the state in Flink as you used to do with the database. And that means you would actually want to like version it, evolve it over time. That means evolving the implementation of your serializers or Flink serializers, but also, you know, just regular schema evolution. You had you, you started out storing, you know, session with a certain amount of information about users. You want to drop some and add some other. It it changes the, the shape of the, the state. It changes if you wish the um it, it changes the, the, the classes that you use in your in your variables in the memory in the memory image, right? So, all of a sudden, um, 
what we need there is a way to allow users to kind of, in hindsight, fix that and correct that. Because most of them just start out programming and saying, you know, I'm, it's such a nice, easy thing. I just program, and then a few months later, they figure out, okay, damn, I actually overlooked something. So I now have to kind of evolve everything in this in this memory image and put it into a newer form. So this is something where where we started working on um, and putting a lot more effort in. Kind of, you, you can think of it as a schema evolution of application internal state. Um, so much for the for the kind of more more high level uh, other the lessons learned that I want to touch only lightly upon the one that we want to go into a little more detail is actually the fact that robustly checkpointing is if you wish then the most important part of running a large scale a large scale flink application and i'd I'd like to kind of um, go into this and and uh, give a few give a few pointers like how do you do you get some insights whether whether these things are all going, you know, peachy and easy, or if something if something um, causes checkpoints to take way longer than you think, or cost way more than you would you would imagine that would cost. How do you actually get to the bottom of that? What is usually the course, and what are kind of ongoing ongoing trends um, in order to like to co keep continually uh, improving on that? So, um, wow, well, again. Um, <laughs> So the, the basic uh, mechanism of checkpointing in Flink um, is, is the following. Assuming we have a lock of input events, at some point in time, the system triggers a checkpoint and that, that is marked by the source tasks of the streaming computation injecting a checkpoint barrier. And that checkpoint barrier flows through and whenever it reaches a stateful operation, it marks the it marks the alignment point to the updates to the state data structures at which point that particular snapshot has to be taken and where where you have to actually um, set the metadata to so you know that you know you can re uh, recover from exactly that point so it's it's uh, injecting these barriers them flowing through the stream triggering the snapshots so that sounds that sounds quite easy there's one little nifty detail in all of that and that is in order to get proper exactly one semantics there's there's a step that um, that I think many users are not not really too too aware of, just because you know you you rarely see it happening um, wh when you actually run it, and that is the that is the alignment phase. So um, think of it as as the following: when when you have different pieces of of computation running around, and at some point you want to establish a synchronous point between them, you can you can think of that as a point where you have to do a little bit of you know like bookkeeping and making sure that let's say in the database space these transactions would have to still be accounted for here while these shouldn't be accounted for you know you have to kind of establish that level and say now i have a now i have a consistent view over all the different states and of the computation and i can i can use this as a as a as a consistent snapshot across everything and that is kind of the the equivalent to that if you if you look at distributed um distributed transactions would be the alignment phase in flink snapshots right so there's um there's checkpoint barriers coming from various streams and the operator actually has to say okay my snapshot has to reflect everything before the barriers and nothing behind the barriers so what it will do it will actually once it receives barriers from one of the streams start um, either holding back or buffering up a little bit of data from that stream until it's it's seen the other barriers. And once it's actually seen that, then it will actually emit um, a barrier and say, okay, here's the here's the the point for my downstream that marks that that point of alignment. Okay, I think this is very hard to read, but um, okay, let me let me try and ex explain it a, a bit. So this is a, so to. Usually that just uh, that just works works very easy. Like these alignments take take milliseconds or so uh, around a checkpoint. And um, in cases when you see uh, checkpoints not you know not not going through as fast as they as as you used to, you know you're triggering checkpoints every few seconds. They go through fast, and then once in a while you see, okay, here's here's one that that takes a little longer. Um, there. There are a few tools that you can actually use to to exactly try and figure out whether this is actually a problem or not. Um, one of the most useful ones is the is actually the Flink Flink Web UI that you can use to draw draw some insights from that. So it, it gives you some numbers like what was the end-to-end -end duration of a checkpoint, what was the size of a checkpoint, and what was the time that was spent during alignment. And um, if you if you actually then look at the subtasks, you see even more details like how much time did the checkpoint spend on 
on materializing the on taking this 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 image snapshot in a synchronous way in the asynchronous way how how long did an alignment take how many bytes did it actually have to buffer and how long did the whole thing take end to end so if you if you then dissect the um the checkpoints you'll actually see that these like these numbers all kind of refer to different different characteristics or behaviors of the distributed systems. So um, the, the duration that the alignment takes, the amount of data buffered means um, how, long, how long does it actually take to establish like a, a point where everything is, um, where everything kind of line, lines up for, for a snapshot. Um, obviously, you, you want this to be as fast as possible. How long does the snapshot take? Synchronous part versus asynchronous part. Synchronous part means how long is the pipeline actually interrupted for processing between um, around a snapshot and cannot actually take the next event and continue processing it. And asynchronous means how long does it take in the background to, let's say, persist this to HDFS to S3 or whatever. And then there's the end-to-end -end duration. And there's, there's actually an interesting hidden metric in there, if you wish, um, which is uh, if you take the end-to-end -end delay, uh, the end-to-end -end duration, and subtract the synchronous and the asynchronous part, and if you wish, even the alignment duration, then you can figure out how long did it actually take from when the system triggered the snapshot for everything to flow through and the barriers to actually reach the operator to take its snapshot. So you can actually see how far is it delayed, is the late, are the later operators kind of delayed, um, rather than uh, or with, with, uh, compared to the earlier operators. So if these if these numbers actually don't look as, as if these numbers look like this then then this is easy. On the other hand, this was running you know like on on a four virtual processes on my laptop, so this isn't actually you know <laughs> this isn't a large scale um, a screenshot from a large scale implementation. But if you want to if you actually see these numbers um, and and some of them are are too high, here's here's what this usually means if you if you're working in your system. So if you have a very long delay until uh, a checkpoint is triggered, that, that typically means that you're operating under a constant back pressure, which means that at least for what the system is doing at that particular point in time, it's actually under provision. So you try to do more than the machines can get through in that particular point in time. And then, you know, Flink's back pressure me mechanism kicks in and just makes the whole pipeline adjust to the slowest part, because otherwise it would, it would just overflow. If the snapshots take just very long, then um, it, it can it usually means that, you know, it could either be that the bandwidth to your storage is really crappy. This is actually, has actually happened. <laughs> um, it could also mean that you're just keeping a lot of state on the machine and it, it, um, it actually means that per checkpoint you have to do too much work. Flink 1.3 uh, released incremental checkpoints so that checkpoints actually uh, transfer the diffs over, over previous checkpoints, which has actually made this problem go for many users away. And then we have, we, we have the alignment duration, what I was uh, talking about earlier. So this is, in some sense, uh, I think the most important robustness metric, because even if the others are high, yeah, if the others are high, you know, if you're in the back pressure situation, you may still be working fairly well. If you're taking long to checkpoint large state, this may still be well. But if your alignments get kind of thrown off, then this is something you may want to look into. So what, could I, what are actually typical situations where these alignments start costing, costing a lot? And again, um, Going back to the comparison, I tried to make a, a few, a few uh, slides back. That was that this, these alignments in, in Flink or in stream processing, they kind of correspond to if, if you're running like if you're running distributed databases and you try to establish like kind of consistent points. These are the points where you have to take certain, you have to you have to take certain. Um, you have to establish a, a common denominator where you say, okay, this transaction has actually completed in all my parallel shards versus this has not, and so on, right? And what, what can happen in, in such a system is, for example, that you know, you're computing a very large aggregates or you're computing very large windows in streaming and you're emitting it right at the point in time when you do a checkpoint and it just so happens that there's huge data skew so it only affects one node and all the others are doing very well. And this, uh, think of it as you know, the transaction would aff affect one shard very heavily and do a lot on that and all, on all of the others it would be good. In that case, um, the others could still not commit their transaction before the other shard is done. So this is kind of the, the equivalent to that. You know, there's, there's just very skewed work on one node. Or the, the other equivalent of, of that would be a node is just like temporarily stalled by something like garbage collection. And um, you know, because Flink doesn't really work like a transactional system, but by like a streaming system, it tries to make progress. But some of the work will actually back up if certain nodes say, okay, I'm actually 
as part of this alignment, I, can, I cannot make progress here. So there's, there's going to be a little bit of back pressure built up along these cases. And in some sense, the most important thing that we've learned in order to keep the whole thing running well is make sure that these builds up, build ups of like back pressure around alignment, they, they are resolved very fast. So, um, and that, that led to two things that we actually introduced into Flink. First was um, uh, a setting where you say, give the system a minimum time between checkpoints. And I would actually say that if you run this large today, this is almost the most important thing to set in checkpointing. You don't, I would actually almost argue that we drop the checkpoint interval setting and actually purely work with, with that, or at least with something that takes this uh, into account as a, as a policy. Um, th think of it as the following way. You, you could, could just tell the system, you know, to checkpoints as fast as you can, but always make sure that you have two seconds of pure progress between checkpoints where, you know, we're not sharing bandwidth with storing the, the, the snapshots in, in, in whatever system, S3, um, HDFS, and so on, but just make pure progress on your computation. Don't, don't do any resources on something else. And then, given that you fulfill this policy, do checkpoints as fast as possible. This seems to be something that, that has, has worked fairly well for, um, for users that, that set it. Just set it, the checkpoint interval to a very low value and then set a minimum time between checkpoints. The other thing that we kind of observed is that um, the more we, the more asynchronous work a checkpoint can do, the, the more these problems just seem to go away. So the, the cheaper the alignments get because they're, they're smaller interruptions that cause, cause the buildup of back pressure. And that is, that is what we've been um, actually working in, in, like in response to these observations over the, last, uh, over the last months a lot, like making sure more and more and more stuff actually gets asynchronous. So if you look at Flink 1.2, um, it only had asynchronous snapshots for the RocksDB state backend. And in one to one there was kind of a hidden feature to do it on the, on the state backend that actually keeps it in uh, as, as plain Java objects on the heap. In Flink 1.3, um, this actually became the, the default option, and operator state also became, um, became asynchronous. And Flink 1.4, we now have an open pull request to also make timers and everything asynchronously uh, persisted. So um, moving, that, moving that along. Um, an another thing that we kind of realized is that um, we were always we were always arguing between should, what should we actually make the default choice for a state backend. State backend in Flink defines both the data structure that keeps in the end your your in-memory variables, especially if they're organized by key, and you can in theory swap them in and out of memory depending if computation for the key is actually uh, hot or not. Um, and there there are kind of two prominent ones. One that just keeps it really as as pure pure memory of, of pure Java data structures in memory versus that serializes it into RocksDB back and forth. And this is kind of the flowchart we, we sort of came up with to, to, help, to help users make the decision what, what should they take. If you have state that is larger than memory, then obviously you need to pick RocksDB. If you're comfortably within actually the memory of a machine, then it's actually very interesting to trade to, to kind of look at how expensive is it to move these objects between a serialized form off heap and on heap again? Whenever you want to compute on them, you obviously need them on heap. Whenever you want to persist them, you would need them off heap. Um, how does your data rate affect that? You know, the, the cost of serialization. And if, yeah, so this flowchart has kind of been uh, a good help to do that. It's a bit simplified, but it, it kind of um, gets the soul, the soul, yeah, D decision, decision process roughly, uh, roughly mapped down. I think we're running out of time, um, and with that, that's actually perfect because I'm also, I'm also pretty much done done with the presentation. There's there's just two things I would like to mention. Um, if if you if you're actually interested in the interested in the stream processing space, or if you're working with Flink and you like to um, you like to share some of your your personal lessons learned, your use cases, or just you know just here's the thought of what would be really cool in stream processing and you want to share it with, uh, with the community around, around that, um, that part. There's a conference called Flink Forward uh, that is taking place right here, exactly where Berlin Buswitz is, uh, in a few months. And uh, the call for submission is still open. Um, so both if you're, if you're interested to be a speaker or if you're just interested to learn more about stream processing, uh, I'm very happy to, um, yeah, to meet you there. And um, if, you actually, if you actually like this whole work of, um, of stream processing, Apache Flink and so on, the whole like, real-time application ecosystem, um, and you want to, you'd like to work, work on this full-time, then um, come talk to us. And we also have a booth in the, in the Palais, so feel free to stop by. 
Thanks. That's all. Thanks, Stefan.